Welcome to tonight's talk. This is the fifth in our series on the issue of uh, marking Israel's 75th birthday. Um, and tonight we are touching on a topic that we've already um, sort of touched on in a few other sessions, this time a bit more in depth, which is the resistance to British rule in Palestine. Um, and as our series uh, has had a cultural focus, um, to kind of explore this topic, we have invited playwright Julia Pascal, um, whose play uh, explores the build up to one of the most famous um, events of, of resistance, um, which was the bombing of the King David Hotel. Um, so Julia, I'll just introduce you now and then uh, welcome you to, to talk about the play. Um, so Julia's work uh, focuses on unrepresented voices, women, immigrants and refugees. She has written 24 full length stage plays, 12 of which have been staged at venues such as the Lyric Theatre, Riverside Studios, the Arcola Theatre, the Park Theatre, the Tricycle Theatre, the New End Theatre, the Fimbra Theatre and the Edinburgh Fringe and the Edinburgh Festival. Um, most recently, her play 1237 was staged at the Fimbra Theatre and that is the play that we will be discussing tonight. Um, so Julia, I'll hand over to you now to uh, introduce 1237 and talk a little about uh, its inception, uh, the kind of uh, motivations behind writing it and also uh, how it relates to uh, tonight's theme, which is uh, terrorists or freedom fighters, so the resistance against British rule in Palestine. And I think we're also going to get to see some extracts from the play. So uh, over to you, Julia. And I'm really pleased to have you with us. Thank you, Emma. Uh, so yes, this play 1237 is the core of the talk tonight. It came to me in many ways. Um, I worked a lot as a journalist and a lot of my work was interviewing survivors from the Shoah and uh, some of those I met had been in the Iagun and, and spoke to me about it. And this is over a, a period of years and I did quite a lot of research myself also about activities in Britain at the plot to uh, assassinate Ernest Bevin, for example, and another unknown history, which I've written a play, uh, was part of this. And I became aware of the non-socialist movement, my family were very socialists and uh, very Zionist, and I became very interested in the other side. One of my plays was translated into French um, by a French Jew, a member of the Theatre of Fraternity in, in Paris, and he told me that he had been involved in smuggling guns through France to Palestine and was also part of that as an act of anti-British colonialism, anti-colonialism uh, and, and a desire to, to get Jews into Palestine. So these stories came at me from, from different, different men, they were all men, uh, at different points in my life. And I thought I would really like to write about this because it's, it's quite a taboo subject. Uh, I tend to write taboo subjects. And I became interested in the idea of this nationalism, which to me was like no other nationalism that I'd ever come across. But I didn't know how to write it because it was so disparate. And then I thought of a framework of my father's family. So my father was one of three brothers and the play in its earliest inception was three brothers, now it's two brothers, who were Irish. My father was a Dublin Jew. So the family went from Lithuania to England and then to Ireland. And I took their story in the early part of it, uh, which was about being poor and then studying and becoming doctors and then coming to London and then becoming soldiers in the British army and fighting the Nazis. So I took the early part where they were very much influenced by Irish nationalism and, and some of the Iagun men that I'd spoken to had told me how they had been very influenced by Irish nationalism. And then I deformed their story, if you like, I took liberties with it and I imagined them becoming Iagun fighters. Uh, well, one of them. So one of them, so the two characters, let me explain them. Paul is the one who really wants to become a doctor and he's the one who becomes the ear gun fighter and gets involved in the uh, blowing up of the King David. Cecil, who is very much based on my father, wanted to be a chazan, but was forced to become a doctor by his mother because being a chazan didn't make any money, uh, is the entertainer. And he 
he's in the army like his brother, but he, he stays in Ensa and he ends up performing to the British in Palestine. So the two brothers are in Palestine, but on different sides. And they're both in love with the same woman who is a Yiddish actress who, who is drawn from research and is not obviously not someone I interviewed. Um, so that's the, the root of the play that, that brought me into it. Why did I want to write it? I really wanted to, to expose this story. Um, a lot of Jewish people said to me, is this the time to, to put this play on? I think they were fearful that it would, it would cause trouble. It would, it would excite anti-Semitism. Uh, it hasn't done. Um, and I said to them, well, there's never a good time to put anything on that's the, that shows this kind of Jewish violence against the British. But I think it's important to show the nuance, the complexity, and also the links in nationalism, the fact that Jewish nationalism was inflected by Irish nationalism, I think is pretty important. Um, so that was my way into it. And, and in a way that was the foundation to the, to the writing and to the character formation and the atmosphere. And because I was directing it as well, because I'm a theater director, it was very interesting for me to play with the cultural nuance of Irish nationalism through the music. And, and Jewish music and, and religious music and uh, Yiddish music. Uh, so that the production actually, it's quite, when you read it, it's one thing, but when you see it, and I hope we see a bit, you get this, this conjunction of the two cultures and therefore the two politics. And it seems to me quite daring because the Irish actors who I use had no idea of how Jews had understood their struggle and, and absorbed it and used it to go forward. And, um, one of them in particular is in incredibly anti-Israel. Uh, and he saw the play as being anti-Zionist, whereas other people saw it as being pro-Zionist, which quite pleased me that people took different, different reactions from it and, and could see that I was understanding both sides, which, which certainly, uh, as a playwright, you, you can't be a judge. You have to just present complexity and nuance. So it, it, uh, it's a big epic piece. I mean, it goes from Dublin in 1935 to, the formation of the State of Israel in 1948. Um, so it travels from Dublin to London and to Palestine. And that kind of huge sweep on the tiny stage was also something I wanted to do to, to, to cause ripples and, 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 and to stimulate and, and to show cultural and national and political struggles and how they can affect one another. Maybe we should look at the, the first clip to show this uh, as the brothers discuss and after that, I'll talk about the new man concept. Okay, I'm just sharing that now. It's so interesting that, that someone saw it as anti-Zionist, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> um. Our cousins in Palestine, why don't we go over there and live with them? A kibbutz. Pick oranges, meet lovely girls, make babies. Are we Zionists? The Irish have a country. The Indians want one. We Jews need one. Palestine. A land without a people, there are people without a land. That's not true, is it? Oranges and lemons say the world. I'm guessing that's where we leave that scene. <laughs> I was very interested in the moment when the whole concept of the new Jew, the, the Jew as a fighter, the Jew as a soldier, starts to come into the psyche of the 20th century. And then I had the question, how do I, how do I show that? I, I can't give a, a philosophical uh, speech in the middle of the play. How do I show that? And so there's a whole element of the father dies and there is a, a quasi new father figure who's introduced, who's a, an East End Jewish boxing trainer. And so Paul learns to box, uh, basically, because he's quite angry and he wants to, to learn how to, to use his anger in a positive way. But the concept of the, of the new fighter, the new Jew, the, the Max Nordau idea of uh, we finish with the intellectual myopic Jew of the interior, we rebuild, we construct a new Jew. And so that's, I talked to the cast about that. I didn't, uh, but I wanted to suggest it. Uh, this problem of 
what am I as a Jew? Uh, what is my history? What's, is it book learning or is it fighting? And if it's fighting and, and making a strong body, who am I fighting? And what is, what is the moral context that, that, that we place that within? So are we Zionists? That's a big question in that scene. And, uh, and it's quite interesting for me when I listen to it now, although I, we did it in December, uh, that, that Jews are speaking with an Irish accent. I found that that also adds another layer of, of internationalism of what is a Jew. So that, that the new man concept, terrorist or freedom fighter? I mean, that's the debate that comes up in the play. Uh, they're, they're both doctors. Uh, are you a healer or are you a killer? Uh, and, and at the beginning, that, that concept of killing comes up. The, the first uh, long scene in the play, the two sons, and this is based on what my father told me. My grandfather was dying of stomach cancer. We're talking about 1930s, I suppose. 19, yeah, it must be 1930s. And uh, they had morphine in the house and, and the three brothers tossed a coin to see which of them would give him morphine to put him out of his misery. So the, the, the euthanasia, the mercy killing. So the concept of killing comes up quite, quite early in the play. And then when they become doctors, another thing my father told me, uh, when a baby is, was born deformed, um, the baby was just left on the sink with the window open again in the 30s. And so that debate of do we preserve life or, or, or do we help it to, <laughs> to disappear because it's uncomfortable, it comes up as a, as a drip fed into it. So that when we get to the King David Hotel, although the terrorists or all the freedom fighters give a warning to the British, the British don't heed it. And so there are 91 people killed. Um, so what questions of responsibility are raised throughout the play, but but not um, not not in a moralistic way, but they're, they're just present. So that's that's really that. Feel free to ask me questions, otherwise I bore myself with my own voice. Right, just come back in to ask. <laughs> so I think it's it was really interesting like, hearing you talk about it as a kind of epic play, and that's definitely the impression I got. And I was I was really surprised um, just because of the the name and the kind of marketing around it um i was really surprised to find myself in ireland and then the east end um i wonder if you could talk a bit more about like the kind of how those threads kind of lead to the the kind of the climax and like what what are the links in those places that the brothers are kind of taking from each place that that bring them to that final moment so i just thought that it was so interesting yeah to see their politics develop and their sort of personality develop in terms of you know the boxing and the new Jew and all of that and how it kind of all pulls together. Yes, uh, being brought up in the atmosphere of Irish nationalism, uh, that there was the old joke of are you a Protestant Jew or a Catholic Jew? Of course, came up many times. Um, that the the Jews that I had heard speak were nationalists because they were anti-British and and. And they had absorbed that, but they'd also absorbed a kind of Joycean culture of the Jew as this wandering figure who somehow survives, but absorbs these little fragments of the culture that he, you know, is, 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 is living in. But I became interested in the way that they come to London because they're poor and they live with, with other members of the family, which is also my family's story that they seem to be snoring off everybody because they were so poor, the, the wealthy parts of the family. And in London, in the East End, they're exposed to fascism for, for the first time in a very heavy way. Of course, there's been anti-Semitism in, in Ireland, but not on the level of the black shirts marching through Cable Street. And, they are, and that makes them communists. Uh, and so they become politicized in a different way. They, they become communists, uh, but with some doubts about Stalin, which is expressed in one of the scenes with the Yiddish actress who's very pro-Stalin. And then the war happens, but the war doesn't happen on stage. I finish when the war is declared, Act One is the end of, uh, is 1939 and the play picks up again in 1945 where you see the characters changed and, and so they've been in the British army. One, again based on my father, was in India and had a very quiet war and felt quite guilty in fact at the end of the war to find that his cousins had been murdered in Lithuania and nothing had happened to him. Um, and the other one had been in Ensign and, and so their war was was okay but but they had become politicized and one of them had become so horrified by the show and not that it's really gone into in any detail that he he has he becomes an agonist uh, or a lucky man he he 
the only solution is is to have a land for Jews uh, and 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 to be a, a proud Jew and and uh, to experience something that others have a right to. So why don't we? So. I guess the journey from Ireland to London to Palestine seemed to me to have a geographical symmetry forced by the war and poverty, uh, which shaped their characters and turned them around in, in one case fr from left wing to right wing. But what is that right wing is a question that I wanted to, to seed in it. It's not the same as British right wing thinking or French right wing thinking. It is, it is something else. It is, it is very specific and so that's what that's where that journey comes. I think Reen is a really interesting uh, sort of what's the word I'm looking for <laughs> example of this where you said is she the one that you meant left wing to right wing yes. um, where she's so changed by her experiences and even says you know it's not just a state for us getting rid of the British rule you know, she goes as far as saying, and then the Arabs are next. I was wondering, you know, what the the kind of cast and also audience uh, reaction is to to her kind of about turn and and how that kind of sat. She expresses something that's very taboo, and uh, I've also been researching, which is the experience of Jewish women who were sexually abused uh, in the Second World War, and I wanted to put that on stage again because it's a taboo. Nothing is really said explicitly, but it's very clear that she's been so damaged uh, that all shreds of uh, sentimentality or softness have gone. And for her, it's realpolitik, uh, not liberal wishy-washy socialism for her. Although she's been a Stalinist in, in when, we, when we meet her in the 30s, by this time it's, she's completely changed. It's as if she's seen hell and therefore the only way forward is to have a state for Jews. So, uh, at the same time as the, I have a very good looking actress playing the role, so the audience immediately attracted to her. And then when she says that, it, 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 you can see that they're really quite disturbed. The audience don't quite know where to, where to put that. So I, I think it, it confused the audience and it, and it, it troubled them and uh, they didn't quite know what to do with that feeling. They probably never heard that before, spoken so openly. And so I, I, I liked that, that I could, that could do that because I've heard that so many times and I, I've read it in the, in the research that that, that was for, for many agonists, you know, get rid, get rid of any, anybody who, who isn't Jewish and, and, and that should be where we are. So it, it's, it's very, very evident. And I suppose staying with the controversies, you know, the, the whole play leads towards what is probably the most famous event and and most controversial in that you know 91 people die um and yeah i'm wondering if uh if you had a sense of a divided opinion when you did your research did you get a sense that there was a divided opinion on their tactics kind of in contemporary you know at the time when it was happening and also you know in terms of audience response and that kind of thing did you get a sense of uh you know, people reacting to that in very different ways. Not really, because they become so identified with the leading characters. They felt sympathy for Cecil, who in fact gets killed in, in by mistake, because he happens to be there for, for something else. Um, but because the British were warned, and, and then I was thinking of the time in London when the IRA, how many times did I sit in a the theatre when we had to leave because the IRA had said they'd put a bomb, in fact, it was a hoax. Um, but because the British ignored the warnings, there was a sense of it's it's the British who are being stupid. So, and that was quite clear at how many times that had happened. So I didn't I didn't feel that the audience were were feeling distressed about the British who were who were killed, but Jews, Muslims, and Arabs were killed because it was a headquarters. So, so it was everybody. But it, it, is it, is anything permitted? Do the means justify the ends, which is a phrase in, in the Marxist phrase, but is there, had they not bombed it, what would the situation have been? It certainly helped get the British out as far as I, I understand it. It's, in, it's interesting, I suppose, I don't know if it's a generational thing, obviously I was never, uh, I, I never lived through the kind of IRA warnings uh, and, and the kind of devastation in London in certain places um, and, and obviously other more tragic atrocities um and I, I guess that's quite interesting because growing up in britain you always the ira were, were unquestionably uh painted as in the wrong for their actions 
Um, but here, you know, obviously, they're the the potentially some people would have seen them as as the the ones resisting the British, leading the leading the charge against the British. Um, today, when there's Black Lives Matter and such a feeling of anti-colonialism, and people talk about this much more openly, that in fact the, the British mandate was colonialism, and so. It, it had a different resonance putting it on today than it might have been putting it on in the 80s. Well, not as I've written it in the 80s, but you're always touched by when you put a play on what's happening in the zeitgeist around you. So there wasn't, there was no feeling of poor Brits in this. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's interesting because I think, you know, I, I do think there is a tendency to forget that Zionism was its own liberation movement in terms of the, the contemporary uh, language surrounding Israel and, and discourse surrounding Israel. So I guess in, it's interesting to, to put, uh, you know, Zionist resistance fighters in the same light as the Indians have their state, the Irish have their state, why shouldn't we? I think that is probably something that's, that gets lost a little bit in, in mainstream discourse in this country that, that the British were acting in exactly the same way as they were in, in uh, Ireland and, and India. I think there's a feeling from, from left-wing uh, anti-Zionists that really the Jews shouldn't have a country. Uh, not that they ever quite dare say it, well, some do. Uh, and so I think that there are those kind of tensions, it's more complicated, whereas the Irish have always lived in Ireland, they deserve their country is their feeling, and the Indians have always lived in India. I think it's coming from there, whereas the Jews mm -hmm. really could live anywhere, what's the problem, they're all rich and white. I mean, those kind of stereotypes are, are what you hear, or what I hear. So... Uh, it's, it's interesting as well, I suppose, within British theatre, that's kind of where I am coming from as well. I think these are quite uncomfortable things to talk about. I think they're not very popular uh, ideas to explore or express. Um, so yeah, did you find any kind of pushback against that kind of uh, parallel that you were drawing? Uh, I think people assume that the play was incredibly anti-Zionist. Uh, and I thought, and I thought, well, you don't understand it then. <laughs> it's definitely not what I saw in it. <laughs> I think people bring to it what they want. And so when you have that debate, perhaps they're not used to that kind of open debate, which we Jews have. I mean, we can be uh, debating and have different opinions and it doesn't mean we stop being friends. We, we, we embrace the, the, the dialectic and the challenge, whereas uh, it's black and white and, and, and very binary from, from on the Zionist, anti-Zionist uh, theater discourse that I hear all the time. You're either for or you're against. You put the mm. nuance is not something that, that they're good at. So. I think the play is nuanced, so well, I hope it is, and, and therefore, yeah. Well, I think the fact that the play sits so comfortably within your, not comfortably, but it sits so clearly within your own story, it's, it, you can't really discount these uh, experiences because they were real, they were things that people experienced and, and felt it, the, they came out of their experiences with these perspectives. There's a reason for them. Um, so I think it's you know important to show those to contemporary audiences. Um, in in the play though, the the bombing is quite immediately followed by the declaration of the state. Yes. Um, is that something that you personally feel like you know there's a through line there? Um, there's two years difference, in fact, in reality. Yes. <laughs> it's a play, it's not a documentary. Uh, so yes, I do feel that that was, I, th I think the British had enough. And, and I didn't forget, and there are lines of sympathy for the ordinary Tommy who's there, it was conscription. So I'm not sure that the, you know, those, those British guys really wanted to be there. Cecil at one time says it, they could be me because he's the age. Uh, so yes, I think it, it probably was the, the most, uh, extraordinary event that, that did push towards the, the the British leaving. Yes, I feel that. Mm. I think Cecil is such an interesting character. The the, I, the idea of an Irish Jewish person who's singing to entertain the British army. There's just so many things going on there, um, and I think yeah, really kind of highlighting the fact that of of the kind of cosmopolitanism of Jews is that you know they can come from anywhere and still feel uh connections in different ways and that doesn't mean that they're all going to go into the Irgun but you know they all have their own connection to that to that place which is, I just yeah I thought the two brothers were very interesting and in how they related to it in different ways 
um, whether they're staying true to being Irish or British or <laughs> or Jewish. I think this is a question we're all playing with <laughs> in a certain way. <laughs> Do you want to look at the second clip? Yes, let's have a look at that. Singing for the 
Break the charm. The Brits like my act. The Entertainment National Service Association. And sad. Full of stars. Know that? Even me. Are you a Jew? Or King George of Black Rock? Be a man. Fight. Is that it? The man I marry with will fight. That's so? Ben Gurion will take you. Oh, so you think his hands are clean? Nobody is clean. I will in a block with other young people. I understand. Understand? He understands? Bravo! 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 Bra and you want me to worry about the others? They're here. Because... They're here. Because they're here for a joke. A song. Anything but action. And in your opinion? What should we do? First, pick out the British. Then the Arabs. Why? Because God gave us Eretz Yisrael. God died in our place. We've lived with them before. Abraham tapped out the concubine, Hagar, and her son, Ishmael. Same father, family. I thought I was an internationalist. Part of the European family, the Jewish communist dream. What they not? When the Brits leave, we share the land. The Mufti of Jerusalem loves Hitler. You've got to stand up for your own interests. Why am I always in the wrong country at the wrong time? Stop singing. I'm afraid I do sing. You make me feel ashamed. Ben Gurion have Jewish thieves and Jewish prostitutes, just like everyone else. I'd like us to do better. I kept failing my exams, and then I'm qualified. A doctor. Okay. <laughs> so, I think it covered quite a lot of uh, of what we have been talking about the killer, not a healer, and and, and the role of individuals there. Um, and also the uh, importance of the Holocaust to, to pushing people into more extreme acts, I suppose. Maybe you could say a little bit more as well about uh, why you wanted to share that clip and. And uh, yeah, what you, what you wanted to show us. As, as, uh, just seeing it again, how do you cover Frey? Why is she sewing a shirt? Uh, how do you cover Frey when, when, when you've been through the show? And, and how, how do you make something strong from something weak, she says. And, and so the shirt symbolizes that the repairing, the renewal, the rethinking. Um, the line about which, which Dosh I heard, uh, who was a who was one of the agunists that I spoke to, who was the cultural attache um, under Begin and was in London in the 80s, who, who told this story of the man jumps out of a burning house and he lands on someone else's shoulders as, or body as he falls. Do you blame the man for jumping out of the burning house? And I put that in the play. I remembered it for all those years. And, and I thought that was a really interesting metaphor. You can't really answer it, but, but, but it, how, how do you encapsulate that feeling. Um, it, what also struck me, and, and perhaps answers your question, is Jews who are Zionists, not because they believe that God promised the land all those years ago, but because they may not even believe in God. It, it, it's much more pragmatic. And, and in a way, these are the characters that I've written. And, and she says, you know, God died in Auschwitz and that the European dream of integration and assimilation is smashed and, and Europe is a graveyard. And therefore, the, the only way we survive is to have our own own land. Um, Pitchy Poy, <laughs> no one knew what Pitchy Poy was. Uh, I didn't want to say, uh, I, she does say the word 
why didn't God, why didn't British bomb Auschwitz? Uh, and that's that's it. So pitchy point, a place where Jews never come back. How do you express what Claude Lansman did in Shoah um, with a few sentences here and there? I've written a lot of plays about about the Shoah, and I didn't want to. To particularize that moment in history, but I wanted to show just afterwards and, and ripple effects on uh, on those who went through it. Uh, he's got a, an aeroplane. Uh, he wanted to be a pilot as well as a singer, Hazen. Uh, the concept of the Luftmensch interests me. The, that, that to her, with her feet on the ground, and, and we have to we have to have action. He's a dreamer, the Jewish dreamer, the Chagallian character. I wanted to set them against each other, but they are both artists, which to me became very interesting when I put them together on the page and on the stage. That she's an actress who becomes an activist, and that word act I noticed as I wrote my notes for this today is interesting. Actor, activist. Uh, that he's also a performer, but he's a different kind. He's a performer who remains the performer, whereas she develops into into a hardline activist. But she, but she does develop. Um, so those are the areas that came up for me. Mm. And of course, he's in love with her, and she's not with him. So there's that too. Yes, and the contrast with the with the other brother that is perhaps more suited to her, um, who who is invested in in the same ideals. Um, but the play ends with her kind of regretting, uh, not necessarily what happened, but she regrets the death of Cecil because he's caught up in, in the bombing. Um, did you get a sense that this was a, a, a regrettable event in terms of, you know, other people's reactions to it when you were doing your research, that kind of thing, that in society, in the Yeshuv, uh, was that a common idea that, that you came across? No, I didn't, in fact. Uh, and in an earlier version, that wasn't the end of the play. Uh, she didn't regret it. I found it it wrote itself that she, because it was personal, when you know someone who's, and you find their body, it's quite different from when it's just uh, thousands of people died. It, it, it's, it's amorphous, it doesn't mean anything. I think it's because she saw it as the death of one person who she knew and, and had let down, that she'd let him down. And that when someone gives you that much love, even if you're pushing it away, you do feel a kind of interaction with it. And that's what she does. So I wanted her to, to feel some connection with him. And, and the end of the play is the two men are walking around her, that the ghost of, of, of this love, of, of this dream uh, is, is also part of her. So that he's always there, even though he's dead, he, he remains inside her, her memory and her consciousness. And I suppose it's, it's also interesting for her character where she kind of loses some of her softness and it's only after this event, you know, that, that she can allow something to, to creep back in. Maybe that's more, you can associate with her a bit more, you can feel an affinity with her a bit more that she is not so heartless <laughs> as to not, to not regret his death, um, which maybe humanises the, the, the lechi somewhat. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going to ask one more question. Or we'll see uh, if anything else comes out of it. And in that time, if you'd like to keep adding things to to the chat, uh, please feel free to. Um, I've seen a couple of comments, but it'd be great to have more questions from the audience. Um, so, from your perspective, um, having researched with a connection to your family, having built these now fictional characters and, and the world for them. Do you see it as uh, terrorists or, or freedom fighters? I think it depends where you stand. <laughs> I see them as freedom fighters because the whole question of nationalism is, is, if nationalism is now something we're just talking about, it's in our life today, isn't it? Why shouldn't Jews have a land? Uh, the, the problem, for, I think personally, if I, if, I, if I consider it, what I'm amazed at, it, and, and I know the answer to the question too, is that nobody saw the results of the people who were there before by, by getting rid of them, by uh, isolating them, uh, what the results would be. And I'm not making moral judgment there, I'm just thinking pragmatically that everything has an effect, everything needs thinking in the long term, in the long game. Now, the answer to that would be, we've just come out of war, we've been wiped out, how the hell could we think about that? How could we even have a mental space to do that? And I see that too. But the problem is when you're a 
playwright, you do see the two sides and it's very hard to come down on one side. And I don't think I can come down on one side because I can see the two sides, which is why those characters express the two sides. But I do feel that Jews should have a country to live in because even today, I don't think, you know, many of us have a mental suitcase packed, but then I'm a coward and I'm not living in Israel. So, you know, I'm living in, in Europe. So I see all these complexities and dichotomies and uh, contradictions within my own life and with people I know, but the feeling of unease is, is, is a problem to do with being a Jew in a Christian society, which has hated Jews for millennium. And as a, I've got a comment from Julian in the chat that says you didn't have to be a revisionist to push the Brits out. So perhaps some of it is also, uh, yes, rooted in trauma, but also just uh, sounds like common sense, really, <laughs> um, when, it, when you put it like that, Julian. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for, for sharing those clips with us um, and for giving us a, a glimpse into your family story and uh, these characters that you've, you've built out of it. Um, it's a really uh, thought-provoking and moving play and I hope that it gets another life and that if anyone didn't uh, get to see it at Fimbra, um, there'll be another opportunity to see it. Um, do you know if there's any, any future opportunities for it at the moment or are you now working on the next project already? <laughs> well, to, to put it on you need money, so we had a small arts council. I know that one. <laughs> So uh, if, if there was money, yes, it would be easy to put on, I think. Um, probably in the US, it, it would be of great interest, I think, in, in off, off Broadway. Uh, so, but I am working on a new play, or two new plays, so yes. Maybe if we go through a few questions and then we'll let you do a, a plug for the new play. <laughs> We'd love to hear more about it. Um, I'm going to invite Aviva now with a question, I hope. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much julia and it's a fascinating subject and material um so we're doing this series now because it's the lead up to the 75th um anniversary of the state and we're really thinking about what do we learn from studying the history then in terms of how we think about what's happening in the current moment so I kind of want to ask you about the impact of it. Having done all this research around the King David bombing, what do you think the impact was then in terms of um, the Zionist project and British relations? Like, did it have the impact it intended? And do you think there is an impact still till today? Um, and what would you want the impact of your play to be? Because you're obviously showing it to current audiences. Mm. I think at the time there was an impact, and I think there were anti-Jewish uh, incidents at the time of the bombing. Uh, so certainly, I think there was horror. Uh, I think the impact today on Jews is let's not talk about it. When I, when I certainly when I was running up to this and mm. I felt slightly nervous telling people what I was doing because they thought it would impact on them. I think what is very important is that this this Jewish nationalism is rather in, put in a separate drawer from Irish nationalism and, and Indian nationalism and so I would like it to be considered in a, in a more um, complex way and, and, and the British mandate. I mean, that area, the period from 45 to 50 is hardly examined. Mm. A lot of post-war materials, a lot of, we know a lot of war material, but that period is a very interesting twilight period. Now we're looking at it with hindsight. Um, with the beginning of nationalism globally, uh, which dovetails with Jewish nationalism, not coming from 19th century Zionism, but because of this, the, the, the push of the, of the Shoah. And when I, I went to Israel for the first time in 64 and seeing people with numbers in their arms strap hanging on buses, I must say it did have a very strong effect on me actually mm. uh, seeing it on a, bod on a living body. And I'm, I'm still very connected to a few survivors who are in the 90s. Mm. Um, and we have endless conversations about this, uh, many of whom are very disenchanted with Israel. It's not the Israel we wanted. Um, there's, there's a great sadness and a feeling of uh, this was a paradise lost. Um, so I'm aware of all these debates. I don't know that there's any answer, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think as a writer, you have a duty to, or I feel I have a duty to reflect these, these conversations, these debates, and it's my Jewish um, intervention. It, it's my contribution. And 
the untold stories and, and the subtleties and complexities around them are, are, are to be explored and, and to break down stereotypes of Jews. They're not just all mad bearded, yamok wearing, uh, Arab killing people. Uh, but that an Israeli is, is a multiple of things, just as everybody else is. Uh, um, and and fighters were a multiplicity of things, and they changed sides all the time. The gentleman who said you don't need to be a revisionist. You, well, someone from Haganah to Iagun, uh, my research showed that they, fl they floated a lot. And there was also collaboration between Haganah and Iagun, but that was secret. So it's very, very complicated. I think it's what would I like? I would like people to investigate and read and research and, mm -hmm. and look at interviews, this history much more. Mm -hmm. But there was a BBC radio documentary many years ago about Golders Green housewives hiding guns under their beds, money from America, sending guns over here to go through France to Palestine, Marseille and, and to Haifa. Uh, so bits of things I've heard and people I've met have, have connected in, into this very wide story. I think it's not known uh, when I was at drama school, there was an Israeli student, a woman, who was having a relationship with a young man whose father had been in the King David Hotel and was blown up by it. Which is quite interesting that there's, there's a kind of symmetry between them. So I, I don't have an easy answer, but I think it's, what would I like? I'd like more discussions, more curiosity, more revelations, more interest around it. I think it's fascinating. I'd love to make a movie of this. It, feels, it felt very cinematic. And there was a point and I thought, who the hell wrote this? It's really hard to put together with so many scenes. It's, it's written like a screenplay because it's, it's so epic. <laughs> Thank you. I think, I mean, so may I have a minute? Well, I, two things really struck me from what you're saying because I went to see a couple of months ago um, a production at the Donmore. I think it was called Silences, but it was a theatrical version of Kavita Pura's book about the partition of India and Pakistan. Very, very similar to what you're saying. And like you, she was really looking at the role of the mandate, the role of the British in the partition. But she was also looking at the role of the British in terms of then the violence that got committed by the Hindus against the Muslims and vice versa. Um, and I wondered, because the King David Hotel is sold as, the, the story of it is often told as a, between the Jews and the British. But obviously the, the kind of third party in this are the Arabs living in the land and what were you thinking about kind of their relationship to? They're notably absent in the play. Yeah, yeah. The, the representation. I wrote a play called Crossing Jerusalem where I do confront uh, a much more contemporary story, which is set in 2003 during, during the Second Intifada, uh, where there are Palestinians and, and Jews in direct confrontation. This I just wanted to look at because it was an Irish Jewish and it traveled from Dublin to London to Palestine. It would have been too much to then put in a whole Arab presence. It was sure. already a two and a quarter hour play. Had it been a four hour play, yes, but I, I think that's that's a, another another play. Yeah, I think I was more asking kind of your own perceptions rather than what's in the oh, play. Like, okay, I, well, I mean, from what I've read, it, it's complex. Um, mm. Some Arabs were murdered. Some fled. Mm. Uh, there were tales of. Jews about to rape Arabs, which were, was mm -hmm. spread by Arabs who wanted Arabs to leave. There were a multiplicity of, of different stories, um, which we're still discovering, I think. Uh, a lot were hidden. And that's such a big story, and I'm not sure I would have felt equipped without doing much more research to go into that. But I, mm -hmm. I, and how would, I, how would you put that on stage, except to radio bulletins or more characters? It would be mm -hmm. a, very, a very big piece. Yeah. And it felt it felt pretty big anyway, and I had to put it on a very small stage. So uh, maybe it's a multi-episode series, not <laughs> just a screenplay. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. I, I think the other thing that I picked up on in what you said was this concept of the luft mensch, mm. the dreamer, or the man who's in the air. Um, there's just been a, a book of short stories come out recently called The Man Who Sold Air in the Holy Land. And it's about that notion of kind of what we sell when we sell the story of Israel. Um, but it's also kind of asking the question about what we as dreamers and artists can tell 
about the history that historians can't. So I guess I'm asking you as a theatre maker, what do you think as a theatre maker, like drama can do that maybe reading pure history on the page can't? It gives a living presence, it, it embodies, it makes the audience uh, love or hate or, or feel something through mm -hmm. the body, through the, through the pulse, through the air, the, the energy that someone gives off. And that's, it's better than cinema. You can feel it, you feel it in the theatre. Um, mm -hmm. I just, we just did a semi-stage reading of a play I've written about Hannah Arendt and Charlotte Salomon uh, at Berg House. And the audience was very, very close. It was in a very large uh, music room with a piano. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody said, it was extraordinary that just the feeling of the bodies and, and then you could see every emotion and I think that's that's very exciting and dangerous uh, and helps audiences understand argument and and thought and emotion in a way that reading on a page doesn't mm. uh, so the, the living body I think why have we told stories why have we had theatre and performance since the moment uh, humans made anything the story is, is, is keeps, it keeps our keeps our spirit, keeps us going. And uh, we're, addicted, we're addicted to stories that we know from lockdown, how mm. much TV and cinema and, and how we love watching stories. So, I th But I think the living presence of theater, and I must say, I, I was fearful for theater during COVID. Would it ever, would it ever come back? I'm not sure it has, um, but I suppose football and, and performance on a large scale is, is still thriving. I hope theater does too, yes. I think also there's something in the way you have chosen to have multi-rolling throughout and I don't know if that's something you would keep if you had a bigger budget and a bigger stage and and all of that but the fact that audiences can layer certain characters on top of each other in a way that you wouldn't if you were reading a book or watching a film there are choices there are artistic choices that you can make in a space that mean that we're making connections between a mother and a lover of the same man um, because it's the same woman playing her right. and what that does. Yeah, so the character of Minnie, who was the Irish Jewish mother, uh, again, I wanted to, to smash stereotypes. Uh, she's an older woman. Her husband dies and she wants to take a second husband and the son doesn't, is jealous and doesn't want her to marry again. And, and she, she makes it very clear that she wants to have a, she wants to still have a sex life. And he says, you're too old. Uh, so she's, she's very much a, a vibrant, uh, erotic woman who feels the right to take a second husband and why not but this character the actress also plays Shoshana who's an Irgun recruiter so she goes from what the audience the London audience might perceive mm -hmm. as a sympathetic character to one who's enlisting someone into violence uh, mm -hmm. but it's the same actress so it, it, it does sharpen the the audience's perception about playing and I'm, I'm very aware I use Brechtian techniques of the audience always has to be one step removed and, 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 not, and not drawn in uh, on a sentimental level to, to empathize, but to look at the character with a certain distance. And so by this multi-casting, it, it does that. Yeah. Mm, fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, are, there, if there, are there any other questions from the audience? I don't have any in the chat, but if anyone wants to raise their hand or unmute and ask something, we can find you if that's easier. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think maybe what we need to do is give people a chance to see the play somehow so that then they can ask more questions in the future. So if it is shown again or if there are other ways to see it, do let us know and we will absolutely communicate that. Yes, it's, on the, it's actually on the website, um, the, the link that I gave to Emma. So. Okay, I can share that in the chat. Are, are you okay for us to send that out to people with yes. the recording of tonight's event? Yes, absolutely. Um, Fantastic, because I didn't want to um, break your <laughs> copyright, but we'll do that. So we'll send everyone who's watching and all of those who are receiving the recording and not watching in real time um, the link to the play so you can see it too. And before I thank Julia and Emma for tonight, which I'll do in a moment, I also wanted to say that one of Julia's next plays, and I'm saying one of because she has many projects on the go 
all the time, um, which is called Manchester Girlhood, and I believe is being shown in Manchester as well as coming to London. Um, it's being covered in the next issue of Jewish Renaissance. There's going to be a feature on Julia and her work um, in the April magazine. So do please look out for that. And also we'll obviously be giving everyone all the details of um, the theatre production so that you can go to live theatre and see that embodied performance. Um, but I and next week we are we're going to take this conversation on. Next week we have um, probably the most complex political conversation of this whole series. Um, we have um, rabbis for human rights. Um, a rabbi. Now you're going to correct me. Um, I'm a rabbi Nava. Remind me of her surname. Chefetz. Nava Chefetz is coming along and she's going to have a look at that drafting of the Declaration of Independence um, and she's going to ask questions about were, what was the intention of the Jewish values that were included in the original political framework of Israel and to what extent are today's government living up to those values from 1948 um, that the founders of the state um, planned as the fulfillment of a Zionist dream. So we're going hopefully from, from kind of the, the terrorism and freedom fighting to create the state to the actual founding of the state, but also what happens 75 years on next week. Um, and we'll be bringing to those questions next week all those complexities and nuances that Julia has um, awoken in us. And of course, rem she has reminded us, which is so important, of the trauma that the state came out of um, and that the identities and stories of those people who founded it impact the kinds of country that was created too. So I'm so grateful to you, Julia. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks to Emma as well for chairing tonight's event and for programming the whole series. We've um, really enjoyed it and we're so grateful to you. And what I'm going to invite people to do is to unmute themselves, put yourself on gallery view, and then you can thank Julia and Emma kind of with a customary applause, but also have a little informal conversation should you want to, if you've got any questions for Julia from your informal chat. So thank you so much.